afternoon, and welcome to Adventure X 2017. I'd like to very much thank the organizers of this wonderful event for asking me to address you this afternoon. I'll begin my presentation with a question. Please respond honestly. Hands up, how many of you have played Jonathan Blow's latest game, The Witness? Not too many of them. As a practical necessity, the anecdote I'm about to share reveals a number of design details that would normally require dozens of hours of play to discover. These spoilers have been minimized to the best of my ability. Nevertheless, in my opinion, the value of playing the witness without foreknowledge far exceeds any value you are likely to extract from this lecture. <laughs> this is not false modesty. If you intend to substantially complete the game, please do me and the game's designer the honor of excusing yourself from this auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> the lecture you're about to hear had its premiere almost exactly one year ago at Project Horseshoe, a small private gathering of game industry veterans held annually at a cowboy-themed resort in Texas. It was the second time I had been invited to speak at Horseshoe. The first was nine years earlier, on November the 2nd, 2007. This happened to coincide with a particularly difficult period in my professional career. I was working as creative director of Imagine Engine, a division of Foundation 9 Entertainment. Like every other game company I've ever worked for, with the sole brief exception of Activision, both of these fine companies have passed into history. We had just finished work on a series of four dance pad games for the PlayStation 2. Although completed on time and on budget, the development cycle was not pleasant. Management clashes with Konami, quality control issues with our Bolivian art contractors, and the last minute failure of the hard drive containing what turned out to be the only copy of the playtesting database <laughs> left everyone involved with the project bitter and exhausted. I arrived at Horseshoe, ready for a weekend of very serious drinking. Did I read it? There we go. The lecture I gave that year, Pile of Dirt with Trees, is the darkest and most personal address I have ever found the courage to offer. Its topic was the conceit of legacy, our individual legacy as designers and our collective legacy as an industry. At my request, that presentation was not recorded. Turns out I didn't actually drink very much that year. Most of the conference was spent in my private room, alone, in bed. I may be prone to melancholy, but I'm smart enough not to mix alcohol with prescription painkillers. As I lay there in a sort of reverie, ignoring the knocks on my cabin door, Another game designer, unknown to me, and far from Project Horseshoe, was up and coming. The following spring, this stranger sent me an unsolicited email asking if I would be interested in playtesting a platformer he was working on. Now, I get requests like this all the time from adventure game designers, but why would anyone think I'd be interested in playing a Twitch game? I was polite told him I was rather busy and not very good at platformers, but would be happy to take a look at his game when it was finished. July 31st, 2008. It's been quite a while since this email thread, but Braid is finally done. For one platform, at least, the Xbox Live Arcade version will be released next week on August 6th. I don't know if you are an Xbox playing kind of guy. The PC version will be a bit longer. In my response, I admitted that I was not, in fact, an Xbox playing kind of guy, and would therefore have to wait. I am ashamed to admit that I totally missed the clue embedded in this message. You probably know what happened next. Raid became the highest rated title ever released on Xbox Live, 
It made Jonathan Blow an indie superstar and a multimillionaire. Eight months and 450,000 sales later, on April 8, 2009, I received a message from John containing nothing but this link to a Windows executable. I replied, you'll never make any money giving it away, you know. <laughs> Thanks, nevertheless, I've already completed the first three rooms. The screenshots really don't do it justice. I'll let you know when I complete it. I am really not very good at platformers. But Braid's time reverse mechanic makes it not only easy, but necessary by design to back out of suboptimal moves and keep trying. I progressed steadily for several days, admiring the ingenuity of the puzzles, the quality of the artwork, and the sound design until I reached a level called Haunt. It's not changing here, but it is changing there. All right, so this is where I should be looking great. This level requires the player to jump repeatedly on the head of a single Goomba forcing it to die and resurrect again and again and as you slide backward and forward in time, eventually scoring enough forward hits to finish the poor thing off. I've been stuck for a couple of days on the hunt scenario. While managing to overcome my poor physical coordination on previous puzzles, this one seems to require a degree of split-second precision I do not possess. John replied, I didn't think Hunt was one of the harder puzzles, dexterity-wise, though. Hmm, I guess the hard part is getting up after the next to last guy. Twelve days of struggle later, still stuck, yes. It's that next to last guy. I've watched people perform the weird double jump on YouTube, but can't get my aging fingers to duplicate the move. Meanwhile, I was reviewing some of the earlier levels and suddenly recognized that dropping a pair of chandeliers on an oriental monster ought to remind me of something. The reason this Twitch game designer had contracted me out of the blue was obvious now. And so was the clue in his previous email. Braid was released on August 6, the day America ignited a sun over Hiroshima. Jonathan Blow and I had something in common. We had both written time travel fantasies about the atomic bomb. It appears you have appropriated the mechanics of Mario Donkey Kong Prince of Persia to fashion a pensive meditation on the Manhattan Project, the meaning of time and loss, and the problem I call the mystery of choice, just as I appropriated the mechanics of Zork for the same purposes some 23 years ago. Never did get past that Goomba. After 60 or 70 attempts, I gave up and watched the rest of the game on YouTube. It was a disappointment I did my teasing best to make John feel guilty about. You're about to learn why it is unwise to tease John from below. <laughs> Our correspondence continued. At one point, I asked John if he had plans for another game. This, on June 15th, 2009, was his historic response. It is up in the air what game I'm going to make next, but one strong contender is a sort of graphic adventure in a 3D environment where all the puzzles are of one simple streamlined type. You could think of it as being a little bit like the original Mist in the way it is styled, but with a different kind of puzzle. In terms of fleshing out the world and the thought behind the game, I think it would be interesting if there was a projector room where the player could optionally sit down and listen to the entirety of The Secret of Psalm 46 with the eclipse projected on the screen. The Secret of Psalm 46 is a lecture I first presented at the 2002 Game Developers Conference in San Jose. It's a wide-ranging ramble about solar eclipses, secret codes, buried treasures, Easter eggs, and other hidden, shiny things. But it's also about things that are not hidden, things that are generous and exuberant, sublime things, capable of evoking one of the deepest and most powerful emotions to which art can aspire, the transformative, transpersonal experience of awe. As I delivered that lecture, the screen behind me displayed a real-time video of a solar eclipse, 58 minutes from first contact to totality. 
It was the last presentation of the final day of the conference. Nevertheless, the hall was packed with game developers. And among them, sitting by himself in the back, was Jonathan Blow. I got a lot of mileage out of the secret of Psalm 46. In May of 2011, the Drama Society at the University of York presented The Name of the Power That Moves You, a play by Hamish Todd based on the lecture. I met Hamish, by the way, for the first time yesterday. We spent the afternoon at a pub across the street from the British Library arguing about whether Braid was a better game than The Witness. <laughs> also, last November, uh, Diablo Editions of Madrid published a graphic novel adaptation translated into Spanish and illustrated by Ivan Sen. Valentine's Day, 2010. Yesterday, I finally got the studio time I needed to record the voiceover for The Secret of Psalm 46. It came out very well. I'm now editing the tracks. I understand the new game is called The Witness. How's it going? By this time, I had left the game industry. The experience of listening to Alvin and the Chipmunks sing <laughs> Love Shack, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, The Macarena, and 20 other bouncy pop songs about 500 times each led to an existential crisis. <laughs> I had begun a new, lower-pitched career in academia, lecturing as a professor of practice in game design at Worcester Polytech. As chairman and sole member of my program's lecture committee, I voted unanimously to invite Jonathan to our campus to show off his new game. In a WPI lecture on December 7, 2011, my students and I got our first look at the simple line drawing mechanic he was employing as a scaffold for a gigantic 3D adventure filled with hundreds and hundreds of puzzles. <coughs> Chatting with John, uh, over dinner after the event, he estimated that the witness might take another 12 to 18 months to complete. I offered to play test it, and he promised to send me an alpha build. Two years passed. I quietly followed John's development blog, looking at the trailers and screenshots, reading the press reviews, and watched the shipping date slip again and again and again. At one point, he asked me if I could re-render the Psalm 46 video in high definition. Apparently, he was still intending to use it. I delivered a lossless 1080p version in December of 2013. Then he went silent again for another two and a half years. <laughs> one night in mid-June of 2015, something odd happened. I experienced a vision vivid, detailed, in full color, about being totally absorbed in a playthrough of The Witness. I sent John this Twitter the next morning. I dreamed that I was playing in The Witness. Maybe it's time? He offered to send me a Steam key pretty soon, maybe in one and a half or two weeks. <coughs> a little over a month later, I arrived at work and found this message waiting for me. The subject line, body text, capitalization, and punctuation are reproduced exactly as he sent it, in the middle of the night. So nonchalant. So laconic. Lesson one. Lines begin at a circle and end on a rounded cap. Lesson two, drawing lines makes stuff happen. Lesson three, lines are usually found on panels. Lessons four and five, lines don't have to be straight and they don't have to be drawn from left to right. I ascended the narrow stair and emerged into a landscape giddy with exuberance, blazing in ultra-saturated color. It was like the Kensington Gardens on ecstasy. <laughs> so began my close reading of The Witness. I had no idea who else was testing it. There were no YouTube videos to consult, no cheat codes on Twitter or Reddit. I was alone and determined to stay that way. I could have completed the half dozen panels around the entrance area in five minutes, but I was in no hurry. And I wasn't there just to play either. I was there to find something, something 
belonging to me. Somewhere in this Kodachrome fever dream, Jonathan Blow had hidden my exhortation not to hide things. <laughs> he knew Psalm 46 would be part of his game since its conception. For six years, he'd been perfecting its location and the requisites for its discovery. He knew I was looking for it, and I knew he was watching. <laughs> The game takes place on a deserted island with 11 visually distinct zones. All of these zones are immediately accessible and can be visited in any order. The island is dominated by a mountain or volcano rising from the southeast corner. You can see it from almost anywhere. I was tempted to climb the mountain immediately, but got distracted by a group of panels near the entrance on the western shore. A few hours later, when I had completed the last panel in this area, a steel projector rose out of a turret, turned slowly toward the mountain, and fired a laser beam trained on a target at the summit. Could I get up there? It was time to find out. After a couple of wrong turns and dead ends, I reached the top of the mountain. Standing there in the snow, I experienced my first inkling of the scope, complexity, and sheer beauty of John's achievement. It was breathtaking. I would soon come to know every square meter of it. On a nearby rock, I discovered what looked like a little MP3 player. And you think about what you're experiencing and why. Do you deserve this? This fantastic experience? Have you earned this in some way? Are you separated out to be touched by God to have some special experience here that other men cannot have? You know the answer to that is no. There's nothing that you've done that deserves that, that earned that. It's not a special thing for you. You know very well at that moment, and it comes through to you so powerfully that you're the sensing element for man. You look down and see the surface of that globe that you've lived on all this time, and you know all those people down there. They are like you. They are you. And somehow you represent them when you are up there. A sensing element. That point out on the end. And that's a humbling feeling. It's a feeling that says you have a responsibility. It's not for yourself. The eye that doesn't see does not do justice to the body. That's why it's there. That's why you're out there. And somehow you recognize that you're a piece of this total life. You're out on that forefront and you have to bring that back somehow. And that becomes a rather special responsibility. It tells you something about your relationship with this thing we call life. And when you come back, there's a difference in that world now. There's a difference in that relationship between you and that planet, and you and all those other forms of life on that planet, because you've had that kind of experience. It's a difference, and it's so precious. And all through this, I've used the word you, because it's not me. It's not Dave Scott, it's not Dick Gordon, Pete Conrad, John Glenn, it's you. It's us, it's we, it's life. It's had that experience. And it's not just my problem to integrate. It's not my challenge to integrate, my joy to integrate. It's yours. It's everybody's. Russell Schweikart, 1975. My exploration began in earnest. At one point, I came across an unusually difficult panel which, when solved, opened a vault containing a cryptic line map like this one. Later, I found my way into a curtained room with a screen and speakers mounted on the back wall. When I traced the line from the vault map onto this console, a video was unlocked that I could watch anytime. This, I realized, must be the projector room John had mentioned in his first email six years earlier. 
The console had slots for six videos. One of them had to be mine. Now I knew what I was looking for. A line map, locked in a vault. On August 21st, after about a month of play, I sent John a message with the triumphant subject line, It is finished. Reached an ending after 81 hours of play, unlocking all 11 beam projectors in the process. I solved absolutely every panel I discovered in the game. My save game, however, was apparently erased or reset by watching the ending. For this, you, your ancestors and descendants, are damned to the 12th generation. <laughs> it was true. I had solved every single panel I found in the game. But two of the six videos, including mine, we're still missing. Oh, here we go again. And a few of the doors were locked from the inside. There were, didn't seem to be any panels. John wasn't fooled, of course. He knew I hadn't finished with, he knew I was stumped. He did send me instructions for restoring my save game the next day. The next day, I sent him another message with a somewhat less triumphant subject line. <laughs> Thanks for the tip on restoring my original game. When I did this, it informed me that I had solved 430 panels. Huh? I remember reading somewhere that the game contains over 650 puzzles. So I climbed out of the mountain and started looking around again. And then I saw it. Damn. Those of you who have played the game probably know what it refers to. For the rest of you, I can only say that discovering it is one of the most delightful moments of insight you are ever likely to experience in a digital game. Unfortunately, as delightful as finding it was, it was not helping me find my video. <laughs> While playing with it, however, I did manage to locate another vault in an obscure corner of the game. The panel guarding this vault is widely considered to be the single most intractable puzzle in The Witness. But when I finally did solve it, the video unlocked by the map inside the vault was not the secret of Psalm 46. <laughs> I wandered the island for another 30 hours, utterly bewildered. Even John became uneasy about the difficulty I was having. He asked me to send him my latest save game so he could see where I stood. Do you want a small hint about where the extra stuff is? You already figured out the important part, so I think this may be just a case of me needing to set things up a little better. A student happened to be in my office when this message arrived. He watched me as I replied to it. I'm afraid I did not set a very professional example. <laughs> In November of 2015, uh, I was invited to speak at a conference in Buenos Aires. One of John's friends, Dan Bermuji, happens to live down there. This was my first chance to talk with anyone besides John who had actually played The Witness. When I explained to Dan my situation, he said that I had misinterpreted John's offer about hinting the game. It turned out that I had already solved the panel that would grant me access to the rest of the game. But the secret door controlled by that panel is on a timer. It had closed before I had noticed it was open. All I had to do was solve that panel again and listen. I raced back to my laptop within an hour, deep in the bowels of the mountain. I found myself standing in front of this. The search was over. I knew the key to my lecture was sealed inside this crypt. This was the moment I and John had been waiting for. There are three panels over the entrance to the crypt. Strangely, they are not interactive. A quick look around exposed a series of conventional panels and a maze leading up to the door. And at the beginning of that series of panels is an object I had not encountered anywhere else in the game. A photograph.
The crypt is guarded by a speed run of 14 panels, randomly generated, with some of them randomly placed. The music runs for seven and a half minutes. If it ends before you solve the final puzzle, you have to start all over again. Nowhere else in the witness are speed or physical dexterity required to play. <laughs> this is also the only use of music in the entire game. That music sucked. <laughs> I gave it the old college try, and every time I complained about the speed run, which I did bitterly and often, he made it just a little bit harder in the next bill. <laughs> this is what you happens when you tease. Jonathan Blow. <laughs> November 18th, after 50 plus attempts at the speed run, I'm afraid it's time to abandon the game. Waiting for the random number generator to roll a sequence easy enough for a guy pushing 60 seems pointless. Several dozen runs later, it occurred to me that John might, for the benefit of aging professors, have provided a secret method by which I could bypass the speed run. I spent days looking around the mazes, observing the behavior of the panels and watching the door of the crypt as the music played. And my hunch paid off. I found something. Oh, I think we need this one here. Meanwhile, found at least one of the loopholes in the speed room. So nonchalant. So laconic. Wait, you found a loophole in the speed run? That might well be a mistake, uh, depending on what you mean by that. So I discovered that once you solve the panel that hints the blank, you could proceed directly to the blank, ignoring all the pesky panels in between, which you have kindly made even harder. <laughs> Complete the two blank panels and then proceed to the two blanks. <laughs> say I'm not a thorough play tester. He did swap out the horrible music with something more tasteful before the game shift, but he couldn't resist turning the screw one last. <laughs> the Witness was released on PS4 and Steam on January 26, 2016. At exactly 5.29 that morning, I twittered. I cannot be regarded as impartial regarding the witness. Nevertheless, I approach the loon. John Blow has made salieries of us all. Great. Soon after the initial release, I played the entire game again, from the beginning, not only to see the final polish, but also to make a screen capture for use in my classes. I knew where everything was placed, and it was done in about 30 hours, with everything except the speed run. One of my students completed it on the seventh attempt. This annoying accomplishment revealed yet another perversity. In order to super complete the game, John made it necessary to watch The Secret of Psalm 46 in its entirety, without stopping, all 58 minutes, if you pause the game, the video rewinds to the beginning. <laughs> I did not give up. I knocked my head against the damn speed run three or four times a day, and one afternoon, about a month after the game ship, the god of random number generators <laughs> took pity on me. I rolled 14 snake eyes and finished with 35 seconds left on the clock. At the moment of solution, I'm afraid I may have screamed a triumphant profanity within earshot of several students. <laughs> <laughs> the door of the crypt slowly opened, and there inside was the line map needed to unlock the video of the secret of Psalm 46. How many of you 
here have personally witnessed a total eclipse of the sun. To stand one day in the shadow of the moon is one of my humble goals in life. Within a week, John confirmed that I had super completed his game. Epilogue 1. One of the endings of The Witness incorporates a short segment of live video. In first-person perspective, it shows a man, portrayed by John Blow himself, emerging from some kind of medically-induced trance. We watch as he disconnects himself from electrodes, sensors, and life support systems, pausing to notice the circles and lines found in the shapes of the instrumentation. Putting on his slippers, he rises unsteadily to his feet and supports himself against a pillar. The map beneath his fingers happens to represent the desert location in New Mexico, where at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945, the first atomic bomb was tested. At the time of its publication in 1986, that map was the most complete and accurate rendition of the Trinity test site ever released to the public. I ought to know. I researched it myself in the archives of Los Alamos National Laboratory for inclusion in the package of my second Infocom game. Don't mistake the fingers for the moon or the sun. This moment is not merely a nod to an obscure text adventure. It is also an allusion to the Trinity Gadget, a concentration machine capable of achieving supercritical mass. In this, it resembles the witness, a ludic fugue which aspires to be nothing less than a concentration machine capable of evoking supercritical insight. A print of that video frame hangs on the wall of my office. A silent gesture of acknowledgement from a cantankerous genius <laughs> that means more to me than I know how to express. A few years ago, I decided it was time to publish that lecture I had given at Horseshoe back in 2009. To temper its darkness, I included this poem by William Butler Yeats as a prologue. To a friend whose work has come to nothing. Now all the truth is out, be secret, and take defeat from any brazen throat. For how can you compete, being honor bred, with one who, were it proved he lies, were neither shamed in his own nor in his neighbor's eyes? Bred to a harder thing than triumph, turn away, and like a laughing string whereon mad fingers play amid a place of stone, be secret and exult because of all things known. That is most difficult. The diamond ring. You cannot know how or if the gains you make 
will touch the lives of your players. I offer you this lecture and myself as proof that we do not stand on the shoulders of giants. But if you're lucky, like me, you may one day experience the sublime humiliation of standing in the shadow of the moon. If we are remembered at all, it will only be because young people are so easily impressed. <laughs> Thank you.